So the fivefold ministry is for actively training and equipping the church of Jesus Christ, right? It is for the body of Christ in every generation to fulfill its destiny by building the church of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, and for destroying the works of the devil. God prepares the children with gifts and makes the necessary preparations for activating his next movement upon the earth. And these are the times in our generation for his children, for us to come fully into the offices and the gifts that he has given us. The fivefold ministry needs to be fully active in the 21st century that we are in for the purpose of equipping the church so the church can participate in the preparedness for the return of Jesus Christ. I personally believe it's it's the it's destined that there will be a major restoration and harvest before the sound of the trumpet and his return for his church. I believe the Spirit of God is going to be intensified in these days, these coming days, with God's glory and power and his authority moving mightily. Amen. The fivefold ministry were given to the church to enable God's children to do the work of Jesus Christ as he has set it up for us. And he has led example in the Gospels. Jesus, as we read, was an apostle. In Ephesians chapter 2, 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Jesus was a prophet. I spoke about him in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, 1818. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And then we also can see that Jesus was declaring that he was a prophet. In Luke 4:24, he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Why? Because he couldn't do any miracles, right? They didn't have the belief in him, right? And Jesus was an evangelist. In Matthew 4, 23, we, we see Jesus went, at, went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases among the people. And Jesus also was a pastor. In John chapter 10, verses 14 through 16, i got some squirrels over there listening. It says, And I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I, which I have are not from this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. And Jesus also was a, a good teacher. So Matthew 5, 1, looking up scriptures, just you know, referring to teacher, is the Beatitudes. And seeing the multitudes, he went up to the mountain, and he was seated. And his, his disciples came to him. And then he opened his mouth and taught them. So Jesus walked in perfection in all five ministries. He dispersed these individual roles to the church to continue his ministry to work together in harmony each gift having if you think about it each gift having 20 percent that would equal the 100 percent right as jesus being the 100 percent as the church comes together if the church is missing any of these gifts it will not be running at peak performance and we can't on our own obtain the fullness of christ in the fivefold ministry it is by the body of Christ that it is obtained, right? We can't do it on our own. We all need each other. And if the body is missing any portion of the body, then it is an incomplete body. Every church, as it grows, it should have every part of the fivefold ministry fully functioning to be completely successful in building the kingdom of God. The main scripture that we get this concept for the fivefold ministry, as we know, is in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, 
for the edifying the body of Christ until we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ we haven't come to completion in the fullness of Christ have we so we know that this is still functioning and fully active as the days we live in so the fivefold ministry is to bring the church into the fullness of, of the Lord Jesus Christ the, and one of the things that you can represent this is the, the fingers of the hand symbolically represent the fivefold ministry that God has set up within the church and I was, just, I was just thinking that God holds us in the palm of his hand. So as God has set us up, it is not for anyone to dispute or to deem what offices out of the five are effective or not. What God has put in place for the edification and for the success of his church is for a reason. And he, has, and he is God and we are not. So if his word, the Bible says there's a fivefold ministry, then that is what is true. And if we don't believe that, then we need to change our direction and actually adhere to the Bible, right? So his word, the Bible says that there's fivefold ministry, then that is true, and it is still true today. Amen? The fivefold ministry period, it, it, it's a fivefold ministry period, and it is in, as throughout history, and it is in history today. All offices are actively working in the body of Christ today. Yes, there's apostles. Yes, there's prophets. Yes, there's evangelists. And yes, we know that there's pastors and teachers. Even though some have defiled certain offices, that doesn't mean that there's not, a, there's not people in each office seeking the Lord with all their heart and living in righteousness. Amen. Grace is a gift, and Christian grace comes direct from Christ, his triumph over Satan. His sacrifice won it, and his ascension, as he ascended, he enables him to disperse it to the body. So he's God. He, he did the work. After he ascended, right, he said, I leave you. You want me to leave because I'll give you the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And so that, after he ascended, that is when he activated and gave it to us. The measure of grace is determined by our spiritual ca um, capacity and our faith and our need and a special mission that he will activate one of, of those offices, right? So, as the hand represents a fivefold ministry, we will come to understand what each function does as a whole. Okay, so one, the apostle, the thumb, the thumb helps all offices and enables to have a strong grip under the Lord and His Word. The apostle is called, appointed, and anointed and commissioned by the Lord to wear this mantle. The apostle is a Holy Spirit-filled person devoted to a strong faith and prayer. They often risk their lives for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the apostle's task is to be a pioneer, uh, to establish churches and church-related ministries, and ensure that they are founded on sincere devotion to Christ and in faith. They are builders, creating a strong foundation in Christ with wisdom and understanding. They ensure that churches stay true to the original message of the Bible, the apostles' responsibilities are a God-given desire to maintain the church's purity by calling a separation from sin and from ungodly beliefs, behaviors, and lifestyles in the world. They also have a persistent desire to proclaim Christ's message and to defend it against contradictions of beliefs of New Age religion, religious trends and false teachers. Now, the prophet, the pointer finger, they are pointers. They point to God. Prophets are spiritual leaders who are uniquely gifted in receiving and communicating direct revelations for, from God by, prompt, by the prompting of the Holy Spirit. The prophet is the eyes and ears of the body of Christ under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, which, see, which sees and hears what God has done 
is doing and will do. The prophet's functions are to deliver the message from God as inspired by the Holy Spirit and in order to encourage the followers of Christ to remain faithful to their covenant relationship with Christ. They are spirit-filled speakers and interpreters of the Word of God, called by God to warn, to comfort, to encourage, and to build up the to build up God's people. They're often seers, as they can see in the spirit realm. Prophets are, expo are to expose sin about what is right by God's standards and warn of judgment to come and, and battle worldliness and spiritual complacency among God's people. A prophet can expect rejection by many in the church during times of spiritual apathy and rebellion. The character of prophet is has concerns and desire and ability to include a passion for purity, a deep sensitivity to evil, and the ability to identify anything that opposes and defiles God and His Word. A keen understanding, a standing of danger of false teaching, and a strong dependence upon God's Word. Also able to share God's feelings and a concern for the success of God's kingdom and his purpose. Prophets continue to be an essential part of God's purpose for the church. A church that rejects God's prophets will decline in spiritual sensitivity and, dis and di uh, discernment. It will gradually dri dri drift away from the worldly with worldly passions and become compromised and abandon biblical truth. But understand a church that is, is required to discern whether uh, and test whether the prophet's message is truly from God. So prophets are important. Prophets really are important because within the church because uh, they, they, especially those who are walking truly with God because they hear from God. So each church should have the fivefold ministry is because it, it completes Christ. And so the pastor has a lot of ish, you know, a lot of uh, things that he needs to do. An apostle has his function, so they each have their own function. A prophet is important because they are, as they're walking closely with God, they hear from God. So if there's anything that is weird or anything that's going on within the church, they can recognize it and they can uh, speak out quickly. And then that's why it's edifying the church because it's keeping the church as a whole close to God. Does that make sense? So now the evangelists, the finger in the middle, the longest finger, They're, they are the ones that go to the furthest to reach the lost. Evangelists are godly ministers like Philip in Acts chapter 8. They are gifted and anointed and commissioned by God, by the Holy Spirit, empowered, knowing and walking the authority of Christ to bring healing and deliverance of demons to people and set them free. They walk in authority as Mark chapter 16, 16 through 17. Signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. They understand spiritual warfare as they, go, as they are going into the dark places to bring light, the light of Jesus Christ. They help to establish new ministries and Christian organizations in cities and countries as God leads to awaken people properly to faith and redemption through Jesus Christ. The evangelist is essential to God's purpose for the church to help the growth of any and all churches around the world. Any church that fails to support an evangelist will bring fewer people to Christ. It will become spiritually stagnant and lacking any growth. An effective outreach. The church that values the gift of evangelists will maintain an intense love for the lost. Those who do not yet know Christ, the church having great power and effectiveness in the message of salvation. The evangelist has a special anointing to reach the lost. They, they know, they walk in authority, they know who they are, they know who God is, they know they're strong in the relationship because they know they're going out into the dark places and they know spiritual warfare, they know these things, they know 
they have the faith and the belief to understand that what, as they go, God's going with them, and they don't have to. They have no fear. They lay hands on the sick. They know they're going to recover, and they have the anointing and the authority of Christ to do that work. And they bring, they bring the harvest to the church. Now the pastor, the ring finger, is married to the sheep, and he's always with them. The pastor must exercise leadership in a church and be an example of moral purity and sound teaching of the Bible. The pastor's task is to help believers to grow as a body of Jesus Christ under the headship of Christ. They help develop and equip and, and prepare the church as individuals and as the church as a whole to help the saints to fulfill their God-given role in the Christian service. A pastor's ministry includes communicating God's Word through accurate preaching and teaching, refuting any and all inaccurate beliefs and ideas and false teachings as in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31. It's awesome scripture. It says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, and draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. The pastor is safeguarding God's people by watching out for any distorted beliefs and false teaching within the church. Pastors function as a shepherd, caring and protecting their flock, of which Jesus Christ as the good shepherd as the model. Pastors are chosen by God. They are not through human strategy or popularity, but they are Holy, they are through the Holy Spirit's wisdom and examination of character and spiritual qualifications. Pastors are essential to God's purpose, directing the spiritual life of the believer and creating disciples, leading the believer to their full potential of their, of their God-given gifts and callings. The church that fails to select godly and moral, faithful pastors will not be guided by the Holy Spirit and the anointing. It will be a church exposed to destructive forces of the devil and demons and also to the passions of the world. Christ's message will become distorted. Many will turn away from the truth and embrace myths about God and His laws. On the other hand, as godly pastors are appointed and anointed by spirit-filled leading, by example of prayer and fasting, the life of the church will become nourished and spiritually on God's accurate word and the gifts of the anointed of the Holy Spirit will flow like a river. The flock will be disciplined and serve God with effectiveness and pass Christ's message to others. Amen. Pastors are so important and it's so important. And I'll, just, I'll wait for that. So teachers, the teachers, they are just as important. Teachers are the little pinky finger which gives balance to the whole hand. Teachers have a special anointing, a gift to clarify, to explain and to communicate God's word to help the body of Christ. Teachers are guided by the Holy Spirit as they are entrusted with the word of God. They carefully and faithfully point the church to biblical revelation and the truth to stay true to the original message of Christ and to help equip the church. Their purpose, their, their purpose of biblical teaching is to promote and preserve the truth and to produce holiness and moral purity and spiritual wholeness and separation from evil and the worldliness and a, and a, and a dedication to God. They do this by leading people to an uncompromising devotion to godly lifestyle described and demonstrated in God's holy word. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart and from a good conscience, from a sincere faith. 
This means that the evidence of a genuine Christian learning is not just what the believer knows, but also what he or she, but and but also in how he or she lives in love and purity and faith and godliness. Teachers are essential for God's purpose for the church. And holding on to that truth and sharing it so the church will remain faithful to Christ. A church that rejects or refuses to listen to teachers who remain faithful to God's word will ultimately stop being concerned about the truth. People will end up being deceived by false teachings and be misguided by religious experiences that are guided by human ideas. God's word is a test for all teachings. And teachers of the word are responsible for it and held accountable by God. So pastors and teachers are held by that word. And James 3.1 says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. So any pastors or teachers, if you have a calling to be a pastor or teacher, you, you must pray, you must seek God, and you must stay diligent and, and in your relationship with God and be diligent into the Word. Because when we see God face to face, he, we will be held to a stricter judgment. And so let that be known into the world because there are pastors and things like that, I'm just saying, that need to repent. Ephesians 4, 12 through 13 tells us that the purpose of the fivefold ministry is for the equipping and the preparing of the church for the service or work of Christ. So it, it is so we can all build up in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, Jesus Christ our Lord, to do His works that He did. He said, He said in His Word, you can do far and greater things than I did. Man, I believe that. I believe that we can do far greater things than we did. Why? Because there's more of us. There's there's millions of us all over this world. So, I mean, he, what did uh, Book of John says? Not all the things that he did will not be able to uh, be written. All the books in the world. Man, if if that's true, then I can, what did what do we say? All the works that we did can't be filled in the universe. You know, I just believe that we can do far greater things than he did. I think as individuals, and I think as corporately, one, we're here longer than he is, He was. He was here for three and a half years. We're here, what, 80, 90 years. That's a long time for us to do the works of Christ. And John 14, 12 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes, believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these that he will do, because I go to my Father. So we get in we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I got to say, it's time, church. We are at a point in time in history for us to shine. For all that we have been taught, all that we know, it is time for us to put it in action. To use the authority of Christ that He has given us, the giftings, the callings, to go out and save the lost, dying world from the grip of the hold of Satan and his demons. God has given each of you a calling. Each of you. And all we need to do is pray. If you don't know, you just need to pray and ask God, what is it? And when we know and we learn and we, we receive that from the Lord, we learn and so we can be efficient. We want to be efficient ministering to the lost and creating disciples for Jesus Christ. Amen? We have to be bold in our faith and proclaim into the spirit realm, my faith is outrageous. And what I have is contagious. <laughs> Our faith creates something into the atmosphere. It does. Yes. It, it changes. It, makes a, it creates a shift and brings God's glory to whatever, wherever we are. And we go into a dark place and it, we just create that shift. In 2 Corinthians 6, chapter 6, verses 4 through 6 says, But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers and God with much patience and tribulation and needs and distresses and stripes and imprisonments and tumults and labors and sleeplessness and fastings and by purity, by knowledge and by long suffering, by kindness 
and by the Holy Spirit and by sincere love. And Colossians 3, 17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And whatever we do, it is for the glory of God to edify the church and our callings. Understand that we are servants of the Most High, the Most High God, and, and whatever He has called us to do, whatever, wherever He has called us to be, we bring glory to His name. Knowing that he will never leave us. He will never walk away from us or forsake us. He walks with us. So we can walk in confidence knowing we have redemption and peace with God. And, and that we, as we remain humble and teachable, wanting to be a part of what, whatever God is doing because we know it's going to be amazing. We should all strive and receive all that God has for us because he gives good gifts to those who belong to him. And so, man, if God has called somebody to be an apostle, man, well, of course we pray into it, and we ask God, and we fast about it, and things like that. If some, and we seek God for guidance, God's guidance through that, because we want to make sure, and with all the gifts, with, even with a pastor, or a prophet, or whatever it may be, we pray, we fast, we seek, what is the calling, Lord? What is it that you want me to do? What is my calling? So understand that as that as he puts a calling on your life, right? We all know this. As the elders, we know this. Youngins, understand this. Understand that as he puts a calling on your life, there will be training. There will be training. There will be teaching. There will be stretching. There will be testings. There will be spiritual warfare. As we step into this calling that he has given you or given us. And understand that it takes time. It does not usually happen overnight that we walk into the fullness of our calling. It takes time. Us as elders, we know that. We know that we've been through the, the, the training, the testings, the stretchings that aren't fun. The spiritual warfare that sucks. We, we've gone through it all. But we know when we step into it, we know, we know that we know we know because God steps you in. He opens the doors. So we just have to understand when he, when he puts a calling on your life, it just takes time. So you, you, but as you persevere, walking in holiness and, and purity, leaning on God, as you go through all the training and equipping, you will do mighty things for the Lord. Amen? So, what part of the fivefold ministry is on your heart? What is God calling you to do? So, we can pray and ask the Lord for those who do not know what that is yet. Amen? So, Lord, we just come to you, Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you for the gifts and the callings that you put in our life. And, Lord, Father, I pray, Lord, right now, that those who do not know what their gifting is or what their calling is, that you would impart on them and show them and reveal to them what that is. What is it that you want them to do for your kingdom? What is it that you've designed them and created them to do? Excuse me. Are, are they to be apostles? Are they to be prophets? Are they to be evangelists? Are they to be pastors? Are they to be a teacher of your word? What is it, Lord? I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to those who do not know and that you'd give them the revelation, Lord Father, of how and why you created them so that they could be um, successful, Lord Father, in serving you. So I just pray this in Jesus' name. So Lord, we thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you, Lord Father, for all that you teach us and all that you reveal to us. We pray for more, Lord. We pray for uh, now pouring in the Holy Spirit as we go through this week, Lord, as we do our own studies, Lord. I pray that you just speak to us and give us new understanding of revelation and the logos and in and the, uh, and your word, Lord. We just thank you, Father. We pray, Lord, there will be healings and deliverances as we go through this week. We pray, Lord, that each one of us, Lord, that you put somebody in our path, Lord, that we can minister to you. 
Lord, Father, we love you. We praise you. I just pray the blood of Jesus over each of you. The hedge protection of the blood of Jesus be upon you. May you flourish in the gifts that God has given you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you everlasting peace. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.